Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to Brown, Vanessa, Dean Bergeron, the whole team here for putting on this incredible event. It is a privilege and honor to be able to be among the learners, thinkers, and doers that are in this room uh, and to share some time with you this afternoon. Uh, the lawyers at the White House told me that I needed to take care of something right at the top of this presentation, so we're just going to go ahead and get that out of the way. Uh, I am not here in my capacity as a member of the Obama administration, in my personal capacity, so while I approve this message, uh, I can't say that anybody else does. So just now that we got that set, we can move on. Uh, thank you. So, uh, so just to, just to lay some groundwork here, uh, when I, uh, f I've been thinking about this question about the meaning of a liberal education for the last few weeks. And of course, I immediately went back to thinking about my time here at Brown and how uh, overwhelmed and underprepared and definitely under aware I was when I came here as a freshman from Wisconsin. Uh, I, you know, the first time I heard the name Kafka, I literally thought that he was that tall, lanky kid down the hall. Uh, and so I, uh, you know, it was uh, liberal education for me coming to Brown was uh, a whole new chapter in my life. But as I thought about it more, other memories started rushing in uh, from my childhood, from other experiences far beyond the formal setting of the classroom. And it's not that Brown hasn't had an, a tremendous impact on the shape and course of my life, developmentally and my growth. It has. Uh, but as I took a step back and widened the aperture, I realized that something that is probably all too obvious already to all of you, a liberal education is not in sole custody, held in sole custody by venerable institutions like this one. It's instead a lifelong endeavor. It is an approach to our world, to the people around us, and to our future. And so I want to talk about the lifelong endeavor that is a liberal education. Uh, this afternoon. When I think about a liberal education, I think about, you know, and I realize, of course, that there are programs and institutes that spend a lot of time contemplating the meaning. But when I think about it, I think about two pretty basic ideas. The first is that, is that willingness to explore one's surroundings uh, and to think about the relationship of yourself to those around you. And the second element of a liberal education to me is being comfortable with the unknown, the uncertain, and the unfamiliar, and being frankly willing to embrace and relish in the opportunity and the risk that comes with that. So, understanding your surroundings, being comfortable with the unknown, that's what a liberal education is to me. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, in a house that my parents bought 40 years ago when they first got married, and in the, in the same house that they live in today. There wasn't really much to complicated to understand about uh, that home in Wisconsin. It was always in the process of being finished or renovated. Uh, there was yard work to do on the weekends when all my friends were out having fun. And there was this specter always of my dad doing major harm or injury to himself with a power tool or some industrial equipment that he somehow managed to obtain. Uh, that was home. That home, that house itself has played a pretty prominent uh, role in my own uh, life and direction. Uh, but it was also like the home base uh, from which I explored and went off into different directions uh, to uh, explore the territory, frankly, of my surroundings that were created by the unlikely union of my mom and dad. My mom is from Ottumwa, Iowa. She's Irish Roman Catholic. She's the daughter of a decorated World War II officer. She uh, is petite and refined. She went to a convent before she decided to go to Chicago for college. Uh, and, uh, and she is uh, very much in contrast to my dad, who, is, um, who was born behind the Eastern Front during World War II to Holocaust surviving uh, parents. Uh, he was a refugee who ended up in Israel, immigrated to the United States to to Milwaukee when he was 16, didn't speak any English whatsoever, and had to support a family that never really got back on its feet. They met in grad school. My mom was a lab TA trying to earn some extra money. My dad uh, was trying to get his lab work in before having to finish his military service. 
and he saw her, he's not stupid, he decided that he wanted to woo her. And so he invited her out for what he thought was a really good idea, which was folk dancing. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and she went, which is still the thing that I can't quite figure out. Uh, folk dancing for my dad was kind of how he assimilated into, um, into the United States. He found the Bulgarians and the Serbs, and he went out, and he's neither of those things, and he decided that that was what he was going to do. Uh, dancing, and he's fast-paced, athletic, and... Uh, 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 events and, and, and finding his way uh, and community through that. So my parents had this unlikely union and, and, they, uh, and, and as a result there were all of these people that, were in, that uh, intersected with our family. There were the professional friends, the lawyers and the doctors uh, who talked about their cases. There, was the, there were the folks who liked the gourmet societies and the eating and the cigars. Then there were the people that my dad would bring home, like the Ukrainian Air Force mechanic and the Italian classics professor who would help around the house, and they never really lasted that long. There was the Bulgarian youth folk dancing troupe, because I had to do that. There, was the, there, was the, uh, uh, there, there were the people that we went on to uh, play soccer with on Sundays, me and my dad, affectionately known as the Immigrant Pickup Soccer League. There was even a guy who was a dear family friend who we called Ali the Turk. And sometimes they would all come over to the house uh, all at once, and we would have these big parties. Uh, and there was this, you know, the lamb on the spit that was dutifully and solemnly overseen by the people from the part of the world who knew about such things. There was the rice pilaf and the tabbouleh, and then there were like chocolate cupcakes with cream cheese filling. It was all very random. Um, but the point is that growing up in that environment was incredibly empowering to me. It gave me like a passport to, I felt like I had this advantage over these other kids that I went to school with because I had a passport into worlds that I could just access whenever I wanted and however I chose. But there was another layer too. My parents were very, uh, uh, both work in family law uh, and in family psychology. And they used to come home and talk about their cases at the dinner room, at the dinner table and in the kitchen. And they would talk about how they were, uh, these, these, paint these stories of these lives that were, frankly, so different from the laughter and reverie of the parties that we had. And they described these people who I didn't know, but who were part of my surroundings too, um, whose lives were broken, frankly, uh, by circumstances beyond their control, whose horizons had been shortened, whose worlds had been turned upside down. And I know that they did that intentionally, because they wanted me to understand that I could have that passport but that it came with responsibility, that there were people in the surroundings who were not doing as well. And as a result, uh, I needed to be thinking about that all the time. So that's what I took to Brown, and I, I think about that a lot because my, uh, my childhood really was the foundation of my liberal education. It gave me the ability to uh, share and relate to experiences beyond my own, to think about and embrace uh, things that were different from my own world, uh, and it also uh, gave me that sense of awareness. And that awareness I've come to from my time at Brown and beyond, I believe fundamentally is just the inherent power and the obvious power of awareness. It is the key that unlocks doors. It is the light that illuminates. Uh, it doesn't provide you the answers, but it shows you the opportunities and the gaps. Uh, it can help you if you decide that you want to do something with those opportunities but you ultimately have to make the decision that you're gonna take that next step. And so that's that second part of a liberal education, that being comfortable with the unknown, that willingness to go over the, uh, take that uh, step across the line. And I know for me personally, that when that happens, when I'm about, when I'm brought to the line by some uh, moment of awareness or, or process of, of becoming aware, I get a very visceral feeling. I actually get a, a pain in my stomach, a little tingling sensation in my body. It's like my body is telling me, we've seen this movie. It's not good. There's no sleep. Uh, there's no balance. There's a lot of stress. We should back away. And it's usually at that moment that I know that I'm actually going to do the opposite and take the next step forward. And that happened to me in the summer of 2009. I was in New York as one of these uh, summer associates at a fancy law firm. Uh, and I uh, was supposed to just have a great summer in the city. Um, and that, I did have a great summer in the city, but it was very different than what I imagined because 
Um, I was there in New York, and there were some friends from law school there, and we had been really involved in the 2008 campaign. We got all these people to volunteer in Virginia and knock on doors, and our thinking was we need to find ways to keep people civically engaged. But the only thing that we could come up with were community service projects, which were great, but there was a sort of a dissipating number of people participating. But the other thing that was going on in the summer of 2009 was health care reform. Uh, taking place at a town hall meeting somewhere near you. It was a raging debate, a, a, a vilified uh, set of, uh, of uh, talking points about what it was and what it, what it could be. But the thing that wasn't being talked about were young people. Young people are the largest group of uninsured in America. They are a huge part of the conversation. But the only time that they were discussed was in kind of that dismissive way, using an insurance industry term called young invincibles. The young invincibles who don't have insurance because they don't think they need it because they think they're invincible. Well, that wasn't right, and we wanted to do something about it. So we started having these conversations of what could we do? Uh, and, our, and our decision uh, around that was, well, we could do something on campus, but that's ridiculous because this is a national conversation, so we need to make this a big deal. But of course, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have any money, we didn't have any connections, and we really, you know, our mailing address would be the Law Center cafeteria in Washington, D.C., in the midst of one of the largest domestic policy debates uh, in recent history. But okay, so we decided, anyway, we're going to try, we're going to do something about that. So I started calling in every single favor that I had, and it was terrifying, because effectively what happened at one point was that I was, in essence, floating our entire operation on my student loans. And I knew that at some point I was going to run out of money and run out of rent and we were going to have an issue. Uh, but we made it. We made it through. And, and along the way, the, the incredible need, the gap that we were filling became clear because nobody was talking about young Americans. And so soon, because we were in the D.C. hothouse, people started asking us about who we were and what we were up to. And we became a bigger part of the conversation. And in the process, we, people started coming to us, much like you just heard, uh, with stories of their, of their challenges and, uh, and, and the ways in which young people coming to us talking about how they have been broken by a healthcare system that doesn't work. And for me, you know, I, there was a very poignant uh, example of that when I had to go to the registrar at the law school because I had to drop a class. And I had to drop the class because it was getting in the way of Young Invincibles, and that just couldn't be, and we we're going to make it happen. But I was past the deadline, and I needed to beg special uh, uh, permission, and they weren't in the habit of granting that. So I went into the registrar, and I said, listen, I need to drop this class. She said, why? I said, look, I did this thing called Young Invincibles. I don't know. And it's about health care reform, and it's really important. And then I pointed her to the website. And she looked at it, and she said, you know, my son is 26. And... Uh, when he was 24, he had a heart attack because of a rare congenital disorder. And he had decent insurance, but he didn't have good insurance. And we have these medical bills that I don't know what we're going to do with. So you go ahead. Make it, make it happen. And the result of that was uh, incredible. And there were times where I was very worried that we were going to, I was going to drop out of, class, of school, I was going to fail. Um, and, you know, I called my mom one day after taking my con law exam, and I had learned the First Amendment the night before, and I knew that I failed that class, because First Amendment is actually pretty expensive. Uh, and, uh, and she said, you know, Ari, you made a choice. You thought what you needed to do was this, and that it was right. You'll be fine. So I passed that class, which was good, uh, but more importantly, Millions of young people now have the ability to stay on their parents' insurance until age 26. Student health plans have been fundamentally reformed so that they have to follow on the same uh, quality as uh, individual plans in the marketplace. People's lives are better, and we played a small role in that. Young Invincibles now has 15 staff. It's actually a national organization. It has offices in California, and it has influence and credibility well beyond what it's supposed to as an organization of that size. And so I want to close by just, you know, telling you why I'm telling you all this. Uh, because these are nice little stories, maybe. But to me, what they suggest is that liberal education matters. It matters significantly to our collective future. 
It matters significantly to our economic and social arc. We are coming out of the largest, the deepest recession since the Great Depression. When President Obama took office in January 2009, we were losing 800,000 jobs a month. A month, that's the size of the city of Charlotte and uh, bigger than most mid-sized cities in the United States. We lost nine million jobs in the recession and we are climbing our way back. And so at a time like this, uh, it is sometimes a difficult proposition to lead with the argument, you should be willing to take risk and you should be adventurous and explore. Maybe for some of you in the room who are students, you're personally feeling that. Maybe your parents who are sitting next to you are also feeling that. Get a job. We want you to get a job. <laughs> or go on and get more education and then get a job. We want to help you in that. But we are at the crux of a moment in our history where liberal education is going to have more impact on determining our future and the potential arc of our economic and social success than I think in recent, in, in recent history. There are major disruptions happening in education, in healthcare, in energy, in sectors like that. And the countries, the societies that lead on those that find the way forward will literally open up new markets, create value, jobs, wealth, and prosperity uh, that we haven't seen uh, to date. And so a liberal education provides for that opportunity to see the field, to find awareness, to have awareness, to see the gaps and the opportunities. And we need that now because all the new jobs that are being created in this, in this country right now are being done by small firms, by new firms. Uh, who are frankly out on the edge, leading, playing the innovation card and, and out there oftentimes without a net. So awareness and the opportunities that come with it are actually part of the economic picture that we have going forward. But there's another part of this too, which is that the risk taking and the opportunities that come with it are great, but we also have a responsibility to own and understand our surroundings. So I want to close on this point. We live in a time of great opportunity, but we also live in a time of great stratification. There are people who are struggling, who are not finding their way forward, and the last decade has raised the bar of entry to the middle class. And so where we are today is one where we have an, we have, we're basically at a fork in the road. We can decide to move forward as a country and seize on those opportunities and be economically competitive and maintain our advantage um, and do that in a way that is just focused on the end result. Or we can do it in a way that is also acknowledging of the fact that we have a whole society of people who need to succeed. And if we build our society in a way that more and more people have opportunity, get into the middle class and can participate in what is increasingly a global and fluid and dynamic economy, we will all be better as a result. And that has particular valence here because you all are in that position. You are the future trendsetters, the leaders, the, the dynamic doers and thinkers in, in this country for generations to come. And so you can be excited about your endeavors. You can take your risk and you can do your thing. But you also have the responsibility to take a step back and see the whole field to be aware and to understand your surroundings. That is an economic imperative. Uh, it is frankly a moral imperative. And so it turns out that liberal education actually really matters. It's more than you know that kid Kafka down the hall. Uh, it's actually about determining our shared future and success. So thank you. <laughs>